You're listening to Careers and Cocktails, Career Talk with a Twist, hosted by expert recruiter Renee Fry. Let's get this party started. Hey, party people, welcome to Careers and Cocktails. Today, I'm thrilled to have Phil Steger, CEO and founder of Brother Justice Distillery, and he's making the cocktails so I don't have to. Phil, <laughs> give us a short intro of who you are and how uh, you got yeah. into this. Well, unfortunately, I, I only have long answers to any questions. So the long answer is the only one, so I'll do my best to do a short version. Uh, really just kind of a vocational vagabond, uh, kind of a pilgrim I've done. Um, I'm now CEO, founder CEO of Brother Justice Whiskey Company. I was a lawyer before that. Before that, I was a community organizer. Before that, I rescued manuscripts in the Middle East. Uh, before manuscripts that, manuscripts in the Middle East. Yeah. What? I have no idea. Are yeah, you speaking so, English? Yeah. So early Christian manuscripts that have been were written a oh. thousand years ago that are still in held by monasteries and monks and and religious communities in Syria, Lebanon, Turkey. I went into those countries, worked with those communities in order to get digital pictures taken of them. Uh, before ISIS came and wiped everything out. And so it's little known fact about Minnesota is some of the most important and uh, the only surviving copies of some of the most important manuscripts in the world are in St. John's um, wow. at the monastery there. So I did that. I was uh, I ran a I was CEO or uh, executive director of a, a peace organization, peace and nonviolence organization, a nonprofit called Friends for a Nonviolent World. Um, I was a carpenter. I lived with the homeless. I've just done different stuff. Wow, it's gonna. And be I was a great... prosecutor for a little while too. We were just chatting yeah, a little bit about we that, were. which is relevant to cocktails. You know, just the the whole don't drive impaired thing. But uh... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, that's sort of my ideal, and it, for me, it's all about and why I'm, and why I'm in whiskey, and and this is probably what I'll do for the from here on out. Is it's all about getting to the truth. It's all about getting to the most vivid experience of life. Absolutely. Uh, and to me, that's what spirits in general are all about and whiskey does it. better than anything else you are speaking my language so what are you making for us today so i i'm not a mixologist and i'm not a bartender Neither am I. i'm a whiskey maker and so i like cocktails as variations on whiskey so what i mainly drink is just straight whiskey a little drop of water possibly especially on the single malts it's good or a little bit of ice uh, or just neat um, but sometimes, you know, you just want to expand, you know, fill mm-hmm. out, you know, go explore a different little dimension of those flavors. And so I'm a not really a measuring cocktail maker. Um, what I like is, and I thought maybe your audience would be interested in, is how do you build a bunch of cocktails with the fewest number of ingredients around a bottle of whiskey? So you've got your bottle of whiskey in the, on your shelf. Hopefully it's Brother Justice. Uh, it goes really well with all these cocktails, it but does. whatever it is your favorite. Um, and then what additional bottles can, should you have in your cabinet so that you could whip up a couple of different variations on cocktails? Sure. And so that's what I thought I would do today. And all while keeping it super simple, right? Sim- super simple. I, I really think about it like cooking. Alcohol or whiskey is to me is all about the social interaction. It's all about the people that are gathered around, the stories that you're telling, the stories that you're making. And so the cocktail making, for me, shouldn't distract from that. It should enhance to it. And so if I'm nervous about getting the proportions right, then I'm thinking about that. I'm not thinking about my friends. I'm not thinking about my family. So I'm kind of just a poor person. Think in terms of rough proportions of things. You know, how do you balance? Ultimately, it's about how do you balance sweetness, bitterness, and depth uh, to build depth into your cocktail with a little bit of bitterness so it's not too sweet, but sweet enough that you feel like you know, it's easy to drink. Mm-hmm. So uh, based on that, I've got some classics. And that's why, you know, the classics are classics for a reason. Absolutely. Uh, and so we're going to do a Manhattan, an Old Fashioned, uh, a Boulevardier, and then one little variation on those. <laughs> and we've got, we do have a little pour, a little pour glass here, so we're not, uh, we're not going too deep. So uh, everything for me, it all starts around the whiskey. It's sort of like I like to think about my cocktails the way I think about my plates of food because I think they're exactly the same thing. It's all about flavor and texture. Uh, and the kind of meals I like to eat has a relatively large size of protein in the middle with maybe one side or two sides at the most and then some seasoning. I love it. And so the whiskey is the protein. 
You've got Campari and uh, Vermouth. Those are the sides. And then your bitters is your seasoning. Awesome. So if I think about it that way, I'm just putting together different dishes uh, based on main course sides and seasoning. I love it. So for this one, uh, if we're going to start with the Manhattan. So Manhattan's easy because you don't need to do anything really fancy at all. You just pour in some whiskey. I tend to go... Um, Really, it's about the rough proportions of the whiskey to the vermouth. And I like Dolan Rouge. It's a relatively, it's a good value vermouth. Got a lot of really good flavors. So there's a lot of vermouth options out there. This one works really well for almost everything that I like to make. So, and it's pretty good. It's, it's a good price. I love that you brought it because I'm always the person asking, which vermouth should I get? <laughs> there's so many there's options. There's so many options. Yeah, I'm like, which one? Tell me which one. So what I want with a vermouth is I want something, vermouth is going to give a depth. Right. So in sweetness, it's going to bring sugar to the table and it's going to bring some additional depth. Uh, vermouth can be a really strong flavor and it can easily overpower a cocktail. So I don't want something that's going to be easy to overpower and become. And now I'm thinking about vinyl booths in velvet and velour. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. I don't want to be in my grandma's basement. Right. So you got to back off. the. I love my grandma. She was great. And that's I did learn how to drink in her basement, but um, <laughs> at her basement bar, she's from Green Bay. Uh, Perfect. And so, but I don't want that. I want to get a, something a little bit elevated. Sure. And Dylan uh, Rouge does that. Cool. So I just kind of eyeball it, lean back. I want to do about one part vermouth to two parts whiskey. Okay. Uh, three parts whiskey to one, all fine. It's just that somewhere in that two to one, three to one kind of ratio. And then... Um, that's, so that's my side. The whiskey's my main my main protein. The dulan is the uh, is the side. It's the vegetable on the plate. And now Perfect. the bitters, a couple splashes of bitters, is the seasoning. Because you gotta season your food. You oh, gotta absolutely. season your cocktail as well. Have to. And so we're just gonna do this. And now ice comes into the picture. Because what ice does is it does bring a little bit of, and I did wash my hands. Just so you know. <laughs> I'm it brings a little bit of dilution. Yeah. It's less about, this is why I don't really get the stone cube thing. Remember that was thing that you yeah, chill the stones? Yeah, exactly. Because it's not just about lowering temperature. You're actually lowering the proof of the cocktail. And that allows the flavors to blend a little bit Absolutely. more. Absolutely. And so a little bit of ice is important for that reason. I agree. When they say cocktail recipes when you're using the shaker is intended to dilute it by 25% yes. based on the ice melting. So, yep. and, and I, in on that, I almost never make a, use a shaker in the cocktails that I do just because it's, I, I'm not making those types of cocktails. Right. Typically I like to build the cocktails where you build it in the glass and then stir it to mix mm -hmm. it. Um, so I actually, I would normally always pour for a guest first. But I want to make sure it tastes right. Yeah, go for it. We have no rules on this show. Here we go. It's Ooh. to your standards. It is. And it's and I, it's not like I have a particular impression in mind. I don't have the strainer. I would usually strain that out, but on a little bit of ice is fine. Oh, that's delicious. What's the name? All right. Cheers. Cheers. So this is just. That's delicious. That's good. So it's our brother Justice Single Malt American Whiskey. This is a Minnesota whiskey. The whole My whole vision for starting the company was Minnesota should have a world famous whiskey. And it should taste like our land, our water, the north. It shouldn't mm -hmm. just be a Minnesota version of a southern whiskey. It shouldn't be a Minnesota version of a bourbon. And so we make our whiskey out of 100% malted barley. All, all, all the barley is grown in the north, some of it in Minnesota, most of it in North Dakota, just because that's where the farmers are growing it. Um, there's very little barley production in Minnesota, although we're hoping and we're working with local farmers to increase the barley production in state. Uh, they just didn't have a market for it. But right. now with our, we hope our distillery and other local distilleries will create that market for barley. Um, and then we age it in Minnesota grown white oak. And I know that Minnesota sounds... Minnesota grown yeah, white Yeah, I know. It sounds super Homer, right? Like the typical, <laughs> you know, Minnesota thing of quietly judging everything else and, real, and kind of saying to ourselves, yeah, we do a better version of that, but we don't want to talk about it. Um, in truth, Minnesota grown oak is the best alcohol oak in the world. 
It wow. is the coldest climate where oak naturally grows. And those cold, long, cold winters and the short, intense growing seasons pack and layer the grains of oak and fill it with compounds and ingredients like vanillins and tannins in higher proportion and slight variations than oak grown anywhere else, whether it's Missouri, Texas, France, wherever you want to go hungry. Fascinating! And when you put those things together, char the inside of the barrel, like our whiskeys are, all in the charred barrels, and then put the whiskey in, this flood of flavor, intense, rich, smoky, deep, uh, caramely, butterscotchy, all these flavors come flooding in. And so we designed our entire whiskey program from the grain selection to the malt selection to the fermentation process to the distillation to provide the bedding for those flavors to come in and then just round out and be delicious. And that's what you're tasting in this cocktail. How did you discover Minnesota grown white oak, Phil? Uh, so I'm a St. John's grad. Yeah. Uh, I went to St. John's and... Uh, and this is like St. John's is in a way the epicenter of Minnesota's whiskey history, which is a whole fascinating really? thing most of us don't even know. During Prohibition, Minnesota farmers, there were 1,200, no, sorry, 1,600 independently owned, family operated, totally illegal distilleries. In uh, Minnesota. In Minnesota, around St. John's. <laughs> Bunch of renegades. I All know. of them felonious. I mean, just every one of them breaking every federal law, prohibition law into the books. And all of them making amazing, highly refined, pure whiskey. Which wow. stood out from every other sort of moonshine whiskey of prohibition. The stuff coming out of Minnesota was exceedingly pure. There's a long way of getting to how did I discover the white oak. Yes, that's um, okay. We love stories. And... And and so how did this happen? Like the mob couldn't the mob couldn't capture the supply because there were too many of them. The feds could never root it out because there were too many. You might if a fed goes in and busts a hundred families and sends a hundred people to Fort Leavenworth, there's still fifteen hundred other skills and distilleries <laughs> right. operating. So it could never get rooted out. Um, and the secret, the reason this happened was because of St. John's. What Minnesota had that no one else in the country had was a community of Benedictine monks from Bavaria with a 500-year-old tradition of distilling brandies and liqueurs. And so the monks of St. John's, and one monk in particular, when they saw right. struggling families and struggling farmers and the business opportunity, actually, that prohibition provided, because mm -hmm. you could take corn that was essentially worthless in the, in the 1920s or grain and turn it into a gallon of whiskey that you could sell for $5, or you could take that... Or you could take a hundred times as much grain and turn it into a cow that you could sell for five dollars, right? The economics are right. pointing you Smart. towards yes, sell absolutely whiskey. whiskey. So the monks of St. John's, in one particular, said, "Okay, you have a right to support your family by working the land, making something, making a product." Obviously, Catholics don't have a lot of problems with alcohol, so the monks were all fine <laughs> on alcohol. Um, but you have to do it the right way. Yep. You you have to make a pure product. You have to make a quality product. You have to make something that will it, that will give be a blessing to your neighbors' lives and not a curse. Right. And so this one monk went to went to work in his uh, monastery workshop and started manufacturing whiskey stills uh, himself, getting copper from the local from the wow. from the monastery and built these really perfectly precise stills because a still is a is chemical engineering. You're trying to take alcohol out of a beer. And you're trying to refine it and isolate it with just a few other ingredients and have everything that tastes bad and is toxic out. So that's refining process. Like that's a precision process. You need the right equipment for that. Most people didn't have it. This monk knew how to build those, built a bunch of them, gave them away to local farmers. Uh, he's sort of like our Friar Tuck, Johnny Appleseed, yeah, Robin Hood all in one. Yeah. And then taught them how to make it. And he said, if you, I'm going to give you this still. But you have to promise me two things. You're going to do it the right way. And if your neighbor asks you how to do it, you tell them. You don't keep it a secret. I you share it with that. your neighbor so that it can be a blessing that. for them too. And that I monk's name this. was Brother Justice. I love this story. And so that's our name. And so I knew of some of this history. And, and I growing up, going to St. John's, I knew there, was oak, there were all sorts of oak trees and oak groves up sure. in the Stern, Stearns County area. And I just had to think. I just started thinking, well... Some smart Minnesotan somewhere is making barrels out of these. And so we just started calling and we discovered the barrel mill in Avon, Minnesota. Um, and that's five miles down the road from St. John's, from where Brother Justice lived. 
there is a cooperage that's been making barrels for almost 100 years. Wow! And they mostly sell to Sonoma and to Napa, and they even sell to Scottish distilleries. Like the whole wow. world knows about the value of Minnesota barrels. And the last people to find out are Minnesotans. Right. So we have a great relationship with the folks at Barrel Mill. They get all the oak from Todd County, which is just the county north, and it's all made in Stearns County. And that's what makes the difference. So now when you're tasting this Manhattan, all we've done is added a little bit of vermouth, yeah. which gives you that depth and a little bit of sweetness. But then it's the rich, oaky, vanilla, butterscotch body of our single malt that then really pulls it all together. What a phenomenal history Isn't lesson, great? Phil. That is, well, in our hometown, like I'm from Minnesota and that's, I've never even heard that in my life. So thanks for the education. You're welcome. Yeah, it's a story we want to tell. That's our mission is to create a great Minnesota whiskey and tell a great Minnesota story. I love it. And we have it. We have both. We have everything in this state to have a world-class whiskey. We've got the water. We've got the grain. We've got the oak. Um, and we also have this incredible, almost mythic, legendary <laughs> hero. <laughs> yeah. To tell, to build it all around. So I love it. That's cheers that. to cheers, cheers to brother justice. To brother justice. So what did you want to be when you grew up, Phil? Oh, you're gonna make the next. Yeah, I'm cocktail? gonna make another one. So uh, you know, I wanted to be a lot of different things. I wanted to be a physicist because I just and an astrophysicist. I I I've just always been hungry to understand what is this place like. What is Absolutely. what is this world we live in? What's the nature of it? Um, I want big experiences. I want deep experiences. I've only got so much time on this planet, in this life. Uh, I'm a believing person, so I do believe there is there's an afterlife. I'm Catholic, Christian, um, but I also believe this God made this world for a reason and it, to place us in it for a reason, and that's to experience sort of the grandeur of it mm -hmm. all and to be glad about that. Absolutely. So that's always sort of influenced my vocational decisions, my studying decisions. So I wanted to, uh, I, I studied physics at St. John's and then I was realized oh, that's just the roundabout way. And so I switched my major to theology because I wanted to go in my, in, according to my faith, like straight to the source of trying to understand what this is all about. Um, but yeah, that was sort of where I started as a little kid. You know, apart from just like the regular fantasies, like I would like to be a knight, you know, or <laughs> I haven't heard that one yet. <laughs> right? But then I sort of looked around. And I think I don't think there's much use for knights these days. Probably not. When I was but nine, we, eight we or nine years old. We could dress you up and get you a sword. We certainly I'm all for could. That. I'm all for that. You can think... pretend for a day. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah, and it and all led. And it's interesting when I did the manuscript work with the monks yeah. of Saint John's. Um, really, the impetus to start a whiskey company came from that. I was working with Father Columbus Stewart, who just received the, um, was just, ge just gave the Jefferson Lecture at the National Endowment for the Humanities. It's the highest award that the government can give, the United States can give to a civilian researcher. Wow. An academic is to give this, the Thomas Jefferson Lecture in D.C. He just gave it um, because of his work at the, at the Manuscript Library. My theological background, I had actually, when I was working, uh, when I was nonprofit director at Friends for a Nonviolent World, I actually led delegations into Iraq with humanitarian aid and fact-finding missions wow. before the war. Wow. Um, and so I had, I had experience of negotiating tense border situations and sort of just operating in the Middle East. And Father Colombo was my advisor at St. John's, and he... Uh, he was ready to move into the Middle East and work with local communities to try to digitize these ancient, irreplaceable manuscript collections after the war when the political situation of the Middle East is just going downhill really fast right. in Iraq and then eventually in Syria. And so he contacted me because I had the theological background to understand the worldviews sure. of the communities that we would be working with, why they were important you know, where they, you know, what their theology is, what their, you know, how they think about the world, and then the practical experience of navigating through the Middle East and how not to, you know, how not to get in serious trouble. Right. Um, I can't even imagine. And so while we were doing that manuscript work, so we were in Aleppo, um, Aleppo is now destroyed. We were there right before it got destroyed by the Assad government and we got the manuscripts there digitized. They're all, the originals, as far as we know, are now destroyed. 
um, oh, so Turkey, you went Lebanon. and digitized them and left the manuscripts Left the manuscripts there. with the custodians because there's a long history of, you know, people from England and other places right. going to other parts of the world and saying, let me take care of this yeah. priceless treasure of yours. We <laughs> promise to give it back. And then they never see it again. So uh, that was key is like, you are the custodians. These manuscripts have survived a thousand years in your care. The odds are better that you're going to be able to keep them survive than we sure. are. And in some cases, that's true. And then in others, you know, events can overwhelm anyone. But it was actually during that process that I really got interested in whiskey because I was thinking about the way manuscripts are these really cool things. They're these physical artifacts, but they carry so much meaning. Mm -hmm. They carry so many stories. And it's the stories both of what's written in them, but then it's the story of, oh, this was the manuscript we had when... You know, we escaped because the men with guns were coming and we got out, right? And we had mm -hmm. in the backpack, right? There's, there's family stories, there's community stories that all wrap around these manuscripts. And I can't write a manuscript. No one would ever want a manuscript with my handwriting. <laughs> no one would care. So I was thinking, what could I do that could have that kind of meaning? Not that level, right? That's a very special thing. Sure but still have that kind of meaning and that kind of connection and that sort of storytelling power. Uh, that's a product that people would want and something that would tie them to each other and tie them to history and, and make them feel more connected and a part of something bigger. And where does it sound? That's whiskey. I love that. So let's make I another love, one. Yes. All right. So Will you rock and roll. So I'm just rinsing this out. Now we made that last cocktail with this whiskey, that bottle of vermouth, and some Angostura bitters. Mm -hmm. Angostura bitters, if you have one bottle of bitters, this is the one you need. That's what I have. You can always add more, but this is the one you My need. My husband was like, it. where's the bitters? I said, oh, it's in the office. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I'm like, I'll get you another bottle. <laughs> so in our studio. what if you don't have, you know, what if you don't have the vermouth? God I forbid. Don't know. I don't know. But what you do have a bottle of whiskey and a bottle of bitters. What can you make? Well, you can make maybe the greatest cocktail there is, which is the Old Fashioned. Okay. Right? So the Old Fashioned is whiskey and bitters. The only other thing you need is some sugar, right? Because the vermouth provides the sugar in the Manhattan. You don't have the vermouth. You need to add sugar into it. And you can do that a couple of different ways. One way is you can go out and buy a bottle of simple syrup. Simple syrup is just dissolved sugar and mm -hmm. water. Um, you can do that on your stovetop, by the way. That's what someone said to me. They're like, why would you buy simple syrup when you can make it in your stove? I said, it's convenience factor. It's convenience, and I'm a lazy person and a quitter. <laughs> so if things get too hard, I won't start it. And if it gets hard, I stop. I mean, that's all. You're a lazy quitter. <laughs> I'm a lazy oh my quitter. Goodness. So uh, I like things that are simple. Um, what I even do, and, and this is a little special because I, I don't normally buy simple syrup. I also don't make my own simple syrup. What I do is I bottle, you know, I get a little uh, carton of CNH sugar cubes. Yeah. Or what's the other one? I never, the Demerara sugar cubes, even better. And I just drop two sugar cubes in the bottom of the glass, add a little water. And I oh, just, in my glass, make, your own simple make my own syrup, perfect. syrup without a stove or any fuss. But anyway, you simple. put a little bit of, you put a little, little sugar, watery sugar, and if you do go the um, if you do go the sugar cube and water route, mm -hmm. getting the water proportions right, you want the sugar cube to be the consistency of melting snow, right? Everybody knows that feeling, right? When the snow is turning to slush, mm -hmm. we know what it looks like up here. We know what that feels like. That's what you want with your water. Okay. You don't want it to run. You want it to hold it, and then because you're gonna, you want that right proportion together. Perfect. Uh, so that's just a little tip on that. So I just put a little bit of sugar water at the bottom, mm -hmm. and then I'm just going to few, put a few dashes of bitters. Whoops. And I usually do four or five, something like that. You don't want to go heavy, overly heavy on the bitters because it is bitter. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point. But get it a little started. Um, you can always add more later. But I'm just going to mix these things together. Get the, get the bitters distributed through the sugar. So now the bitters, the, the sugar, the simple syrup, is now spread and smoothing out the bitterness. So now it's just distributing the flavor throughout the syrup. I love all your descriptions. Now that I've got that done, I'm gonna add a little ice. You sure you weren't a chemistry major? I'm not, I wasn't a chemistry major. Again, that was too hard. Well, I'm sh 
clearly you're good at everything you do, so that's the... <laughs> that was too hard. Um, but yeah, I want to tell because, you know, and, and in some ways, like, the theology background is good because you're not super technical, but you learn how to think logically. And then I went to law school, which also helped. So I was a lawyer for a little while. Um, so I just read, you know, just read a, read a simple chemistry book, try to understand what the chemistry is of all this stuff, ask, and then ask people who really know what they're doing to do it. So now I'm just kind of adding the whiskey until it looks right. And I want this color. For me, it's all about the color. Mm. So now I'm getting this really nice sort of orangish golden color. The proportions were kind of roughly right. You just want a little layer of that syrup and bitter syrup kind of on the bottom. And then add in the whiskey. And, be, and the other great thing about doing it this way is you can trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, Swish it around. Just I'm just trying to get the the bitter syrup uh, distributed throughout the whiskey cocktail. I'm gonna do my little side pour sure. here. Make sure it tastes good. And now, sorry for letting those oh, ice fine. cubes go in. We do have a strainer, but it's not on the table today. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. See what you think of that. That's delicious. And this is old fashioned, right? It's old fashioned. Yeah. Now it's not a Wisconsin old fashioned. What's so a Wisconsin old fashioned? Brandy. Oh. Brandy old fashioned. I don't think I've had a brandy old fashioned. I I love tequila. I've had a tequila old Ooh, fashioned. That would be really good. People have to make it right though. Yeah. I'm very particular. Yeah. Um, but when my friend was explaining it to me, he's like, Renee, all it is is spirit, sugar, and bitters. And that you can make any right. old fashioned with any type of right. spirit. It's true. But this is like it's got a little more a little more sweetness than the previous mm -hmm. drink that we had. Mm -hmm. But it's so smooth. Mm -hmm. yeah, a really rich flavor. Mm. Now there are two ways to garnish this. You notice I'm not doing any garnishes yeah. right now. I'm not really a garnish person. Um, if they add to the if they add to the overall experience, I'll garnish. Um, this one, a good garnish. I just like the orange peel. Okay. Right. Just I just take a knife. I don't have a special peeler. Just take a knife. Try to get that top layer of just the rind off mm -hmm. without getting into the white pulpy stuff. Just sort of that. A little bit of a twist. I rub the glass because that. Oh, the, you rub the glass. Because it's about the aroma. Ah, oh, new trick that I. It's going to my toolbox. Yeah. I just throw it in, so now I know. Rub the rim of the glass and then drop it in. Because when you're squeezing it, when yeah. you when you do that little twist in the rind. It's pressing, it's expressing the oils, sure. those citrus oils out of the rind. And then those oils are now on the outside of the rind and they taste bitter, but they give off a great aroma. So that's why if you do it around Got the it. rim of the glass, then you're getting the aroma in as you're drinking and then you're not getting as much bitterness. And it will add a little bit of bitterness to the cocktail, but not very much. Um, and that's, to me, it's about the aroma and not the appearance. So I will garnish if the garnish adds to the taste and flavor. Fascinating. And typically not if it just is there for sure. for looks. But that's, again, I'm not a mixologist and a bartender, though. So uh, it's just about me in the home, entertaining friends, or unwinding at the end of the day so I'm not overly fussy. I love it. So that is the old-fashioned. A lot of people add cherries, mm -hmm. cherry and orange, or they'll muddle in cherry and orange. Totally acceptable. It's not my style. For me, the cherry goes in the vermouth and goes into the Manhattan because the cherry is accenting the cherry flavors of the vermouth. Whereas when you've got an old fashioned, it's more about those orange and citrus flavors. And the cherry, to me, it just feels sort of out of place. It's like somebody that got invited to the wrong party. That's you know. <laughs> Speaking of party, yeah. Phil, who would you invite on your party bus? Mm. Famous living person that you would just one. Well. You could have more. You know, as weird as it is, J.R.R. Tolkien. Oh, that's For a, sure. That's an interesting 100%. one, right? Because he smokes a pipe. Always cool. <laughs> He's always going to have a great jacket, like tweed. I can ask him where he got it. I don't even know if I know what he looks like. He's the Lord of the Rings guy. Yeah, he's right? the Lord of the Rings guy. Oh my gosh! And what, how fun! Like, hey, let's talk hobbits. Right. You know. So I, I'll tell you a little secret. I was never into fantasy movies or books or anything until I met my husband. And he's totally into that mm. stuff. 
And so then I started reading and totally got into it. Thank God I did, though, because then right. I was interested in watching Game of Thrones. Yes. I would have never been interested yes. if I wasn't exposed to totally. that fantasy land. It's all about having an open mind, right? Yep, totally. And I think I love Game of Thrones. I love Lord of the Rings. And there's just no doubt that Game of Thrones is sort of like nihilist Lord of the Rings. Right. You know what I mean? It's got all the same kind of things. We got dragons, we got dragons. We got elves, we got elves, right? <laughs> Where we got sort of mythical beings, we got mythical beings. We've got, you know, it's all the sort of same world, except in Tolkien's world, Tolkien was a kind of, he was a Catholic, he was a kind of believing person. So he had this feeling that even though there's no overt religion, it's still this universe where there's grace. And so there's these moments in the books, especially, and even in the movie, they did a really good job of this in the Lord of the Rings. I'm not a fan of the Hobbit movies. Oh. But uh, in the Lord of the Rings movies, there are these moments of, in books, there's these moments of grace where something goes the right way. Yep. And Tolkien's never trying to proselytize or evangelize on that. It's just his view of the universe. Whereas George R. R. Martin's view of the universe, no. <laughs> that God, that grace, not there. Which is also f super fun, right? Because right. you get some, you get the red wedding in there oh as a result gosh. of that world. Oh my gosh. All right. So we've got right. the old fashioned and we've got... Um, now, normally, I would never pour out a drink like that, but since Me we're either. burning through them. Yeah. Um, we want maximum drink making today. Now you want to go in a different direction. You want to add a second bottle. So you like the idea of the Dolan. You like the idea of having a, a vermouth there. And you're like, but, you know, I got to get out of the world, of the, out of the Manhattan yeah. the fashion world. I got to go one step beyond that. I would say, for me, the next bottle that you get is Campari mm. um, or any Amaro. I like Campari. Again, it's not super fussy. You know exactly what you're getting. Mm -hmm. um, and you can make a couple of different cocktails with just the Campari. Um, the one that we're going to make right now is the Boulevardier. So the Boulevardier is just, it's basically a Manhattan, except you're substituting, you're not putting in bitters. You can put Mr. Bitters aside, he needs a rest. And instead, you're substituting a little bit of the vermouth you're replacing with a little bit of the Campari. Campari is a bitter orange mm -hmm. liqueur. On its own, a lot of people like it. I'll sometimes drink it, but it's super bitter, so I'm not. They drink it neat? Yeah, a lot of people do, or on ice, hmm. or a Campari, uh, Campari spritz. Hmm. Uh, in Europe, that's a, a very, very popular cocktail where you just do. Uh, sparkling water and Campari on some ice because mm. it's very sweet. Mm. It's a little, it's one of these things that on its own is very sweet and very bitter, which makes it really fun when you're then diluting it and distributing it out through a cocktail. Sure. I've never had Campari on All its All right. Own. Well, let's see if you, let me yeah. see. I think we got room in here still. We have room. My globe. <laughs> <laughs> this will be the last, I think that's the last one though that I'm going to be able to get away with. Um, so again, you start off with some whiskey. I just pour it in until it looks right. Now I'm gonna add just a little bit of, cause now I'm thinking about if it's two to one or really three to one, mm -hmm. that's what I think is the best with the Manhattan. I'm still doing a three to one ratio, except the one is now gonna be half vermouth, half Campari. Got it. That's gonna be the little difference here. Oh, that's gonna be exciting to taste. And so we put the vermouth in because the vermouth is going to give this that depth we were talking about. Mm -hmm. There's sugar in it, but it's more about this depth. It gives it a base note, right? You need that base note just to sort of hear it and, and have, all the, I'll have all the harmonies come together. So now I'm going to just add roughly the same amount of Campari that I put in as the vermouth I put in. Plus, that's a, that's a beautiful color, I think. It is. Yeah. Like one this by itself favorites. is too much. Yeah, the Campari drink... is very red. It's That's very why I've red. never drank it alone, solo. I'm going to have to try it though eventually here. So now I'm going to add a little ice. Again, I'm, main... I'm chilling it a little bit, but mainly it's about, I'm just trying to dilute it down a little bit, get some water in there, lower the proof so that the flavors can kind of all blend together. Stir it. And you said this is a Boulevardier? Boulevardier. I don't know the Boulevard origin. Boulevardier. I call it a, when I use Brother Justice, I call it a Boulevard J. Boulevard J. A Boulevard J. Because we're using the Brother Justice. I'm I sure love I it. got this right. <laughs> I 
really like that. I was going to say, you haven't been off yet today, so your cocktailing skills are on point. Thank you. It's just, you know, trial and error. Oh, that's good. They're all so different. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, you, I can drink. I could drink a lot of these. It's a. This is a very dangerous cocktail. I'm trying to describe it. It's the finish is different. It's like you're feeling the oxygen leave your mouth almost for some oh, that's reason. That's interesting. Yeah. So that's that bitterness. The bitterness that's is like the bitterness. pulling. It's kind of pulling on your mouth a little bit, but then there's just this really right that. But if you build a base, right, the base of the kind of that vanilla, orange, caramel kind of base on top of it, then when the when the bitterness is pulling, it's not like extracting, right? It's just that little bit of excitement. Yeah, I think it's a, an exciting cocktail because of that. It just kind of pulls on your mouth Yeah, a little that's bit, what I'm feeling. But then it brings the, and this is a super bitter cocktail. I love bitter things. So every palate is totally different. Right. And, I, and it is true. The best cocktail in the world is the cocktail you like best. Absolutely. The best whiskey in the world is the whiskey you like best. There is absolutely no... Anyone that says, oh, there's this hierarchy of stuff, it's just not there. Right. Um, I love the bitterness because that that just... it draw, Like you're saying, it, like it draws you out. Yeah. It says, oh, I need a little more of that. Right. But then it leaves you with this really kind of nice, delicate aftertaste at the same time. Totally. I mean, it's almost refreshing yes yep it's like it's cleansed my it, i feel the oxygen removed from my mouth and then it's this refreshing after yeah. feeling and taste interesting i like that i don't like things that kind of coat my mouth in a flavor and i'm always like so i'm not a big sweet eater oh because just that sugar coating yeah. that's sort of left in your mouth is just for sort of like so a bitter, the bitterness cleans that out. Same as acidity. Yeah. So that's why citrus cocktails are so popular. Like a margarita, you know, the great thing about a margarita, there is no bad margarita. You can go <laughs> to isn't. Chili's. <laughs> you can go to Chi-Chi's. You can go anywhere. Does Chi-Chi's exist? I don't know. And <laughs> it does not matter. It is impossible to make, no matter what you use, it's impossible to make a bad margarita. Now, there are better margaritas for right. sure right but i've never and i've drank in dives i've never had a bad margarita why because it's sugar acidity and alcohol and when you put those three things together it's great always absolutely absolutely always. um so the same thing this is sort of the whiskey version of that because of the campari replaces the triple sec or the citrus and citrus is a little bitter, right? It, or mm -hmm. it's, it's, it has that cutting acidity. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can keep drinking so many margaritas because the acidity is sort of like cutting through the sweetness. Oh, that's why Whereas we you like get, yeah. two and three and four margaritas. Exactly. The same deal with the Boulevard J or the Boulevard J. The Boulevard so, J. The Boulevard J. I love it. I think it. it's a great one. I, there's something about it I just keep. I love it. Thanks for sharing it with us. You're welcome. So tell me. Yes. What is your biggest failure and how did you overcome it, Phil? Yeah, biggest failure? Or a it's, failure. It's just a string of failures. I really right? Think, That's how I feel. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's funny. You, I, didn't, I didn't know you would ask that, but it's really funny. So I, when I was at St. John's, I gave... I was elected to give our commencement address at graduation. Oh, wow. And my theme was failure. Now, and it was failure. It, it's a weird one, right? For graduation, typically it's all about, you're going to be great. You're going to be successes. Do this. Work hard. Things yep. rewards will come. <laughs> and my speech was really like, no, that's not life. You're ahead of your time that's, then. That's not life. And in fact, the pursuit of success... And the fear of failure can lead you to brutality, right? You, you misuse people. You misuse your own life if you're so focused on success. Because if you're just focused, if you're, all you're having is successes, it's because your ambitions are too small. Amen. And the, most, and the first ambition that gets thrown out, especially I think in our culture, is the ambition to be good. The ambition to be kind. The ambition to be, you know, somebody who builds and nurtures and nourishes and 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 loves other people 
And that's, that's actually the most important thing. Absolutely. And so if, if it's the tension of trying to do that while you're also trying to create and build and make some money and create some security for your family and do all these other things that Absolutely. are also good things, it's that tension. And if you're keeping in those tension, well, you're going to fail all the time. I certainly have failed over and over again. So what's the biggest failure? I don't, I don't even know how to, I, I don't even know. I, there's just, there's just so many of them. Sure. I don't know how well, to. Well, how about this? So Phil, maybe how, how do you, when you, when you, account, or when you face an obstacle, how do you pick yourself back up oh. and keep going? Well, for me, the biggest motivation is accountability. I have an internal drive to do things, but I mentioned I'm a lazy quitter. <laughs> This is who I am. I'm a lazy, dreaming quitter. I don't believe it. So a lazy quitter. Who's a, who who's a daydreamer, justice. right? I'm a daydreaming, lazy quitter. Is if you really broke it down, that's me. So if I'm going to succeed or if I'm going to get back up, it's because I'm accountable to somebody. It's because I made a promise. And because I have somebody's trust. And is that your own trust? It Are you be. always accountable to yourself? And I your try to trust? be. For me, it's I don't I don't see that. I have an inner relationship with God, mm -hmm. and so it's that's the trust, right? That's the relationship. I don't I, I don't know that I I know people talk about sort of having a relationship with themselves or owing things to themselves. I don't have that feeling. I have a sense of who I'm supposed to be, and who I've been created to be, and who I'm called to be. I have a feeling for that. I don't have a definition of what that is, but I have a feeling for it. Right. And I'm trying to pursue that. Which but is that's incredible because I think so many people are trying to find that. Yeah, maybe. I, I, I have always looked for it. I don't know why. Me too. Yeah. Me it's too. a different thing. Because we're that each motivation. here to create things and we're here for a reason. Yes, I believe Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so I don't feel I owe anything to myself. I do feel I owe something to the self I was created to be. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And then I know I owe things to other people. And I feel that's good. I think it's good to owe things to other people. I think it's good to be like, you're counting on me for this, so I need to deliver. Sure. And that's what picks me up when I have the failures. I mean, in this business, I describe being an entrepreneur, especially a whiskey entrepreneur, as every day is a near-death experience. <laughs> Every day is a near-death experience. And okay, near -death okay, experience, you're kind of exaggerating. No. When you're starting a business, especially one like this, where there are so many variables and the payoffs are so far in the future, you've got to age this product before you can drink it. Oh, that's right. There are more things that can kill you than can give you life when you're an entrepreneur, I think, when you're doing a startup. And right. so I'm every day, I'm one mistake... I'm one external force away from the whole thing falling apart. I think that's true. That makes me emotional. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and we've, and we've come up with that and we've come against that. I mean, our company has nearly died a hundred times between when I first had the dream and today. And we've still got a many things to overcome in front of us. But to me, that's not unusual. That's not remarkable. That's life. Yeah, that's, that's just totally what it means life. to be not in a fantasy world. Absolutely. But in this world. And so um, we've had things where I were, you know, there have been days when I've said, well, we can pay next payroll. I don't know about the one after that. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god yeah and you have employees and i have employees <laughs> i have people whose families are counting on me to make that happen so one it's never good to be in that situation no. so that some string of failures led to that being in that situation but now then you sort of like are backed up against the wall and say okay well here i can't fail absolutely i can fail in these places mm -hmm. i can fail in these places but on this thing i cannot fail i gotta get the money in the bank I got to have, I got to have more in, I've got to more, have more in balance than withdrawals mm -hmm. tomorrow. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs out there can relate to that. Oh, absolutely. And so you sort of pick the things you can, if you allow yourself to fail in all these other ways and then decide, 
I'm not going to fail here and I'm not going to fail here. If you say I'm never going to fail, you're going to have, you're, it's basically going to be. You're in Disneyland. Yeah. It's a, it's a domino effect yeah. of failure if you say I'm never going to fail. But if you say I'm going to be allowed to fail in these places because I'm trying to do these things and that's hard. I'm going to allow myself to fail in those things. I'm going to try not to. I'm going right. to try not to, but I'm not going to fail here. I think that's the key. I love it. And when it's other people, and that's why I say accountability sure. is the biggest motivation. Because the, mo- the places where I say I'm not going to fail here, it's when there are other people who are counting on me mm. for something important to them. I'm not going to fail there. If it's just me and my, like I said, my daydreaming, lazy, quitting self, <laughs> okay, that one can <laughs> fall down too because I'll just read and, or I'll just sort of dream and I'll be fine. Sure. But if it's other people, then I'm not going to do it. I love it. So Are you making one more drink? <laughs> <laughs> Holy moly. So that's all been with our whiskey. And at this point, it's probably a good idea just maybe to taste, you know, this has been the base of all of our whiskey so oh, far. Oh, yeah. The American Brother Justice, the right? The American, Single Malt American Single whiskey. Malt American, which yeah. Jody Mayer turned us on to and introduced Jody us. the best. Cheers to Jody. To Jody. Mm-hmm. And we, when she came on the show... She wanted a special cocktail yes. involving the silver. Well, it was hard enough to find the Brother Justice American yeah. Single Malt, wh- malt Whiskey. And uh, Megan on my team did hunt it down. Great job, Megan. And then she's like, Jody arrives and says, oh, we can't make that with the merit no it has to be silver and i'm like we're like oh no we didn't get the right brother justice whiskey how does this happen and she was gracious enough she said it's good neat so that's what we rolled with very nice on her episode and it is so good thank you like thank you you she reintroduced me back to whiskey hmm because this is magnificent this is the best whiskey i've had that's thank you. And very I much. would never dream of drinking whiskey neat, and this you can drink neat. Thank you. That's by design. So it's you hope that that's what you're going to do, and it's so wonderful to hear that it's successful uh, for you because this has been. We've been in our. We're literally in an underground distillery. Really, in yeah. the cities? In the cities, in Where? northeast Minneapolis, we are below ground in a basement of a warehouse. And we've been there for over four years and we are just working, right? So the other thing about failure is it can never, failure can never be a result of my not working. I say I'm lazy, but I'm accountable. We work, right? He's not lazy. You put in the work when other people are counting on you. So if I'm going to put a whiskey out there and I'm going to put a label out there, I'm going to put a price on it and then people are going to take it to a cash register and they're going to hand over their money. Mm -hmm. There's a promise in that bottle, right? There's a promise in that bottle that it's going to be worth your hard work to pan that over, right? I take that really seriously. And so we've worked for years to make sure that when people hand, you know, when people part with their money, they're getting something that's more than what they expect. I love that because that's what I think of my business at Tail and Q. Mm, mm, we are always delivering more mm. than they pay in cash value. That's, that's the way we're speaking the same language. It's the right way, isn't mm-hmm, it? Mm-hmm. And then it's rewarding because then it's it's a little selfish then because then you're sort of like, well, then how good does that feel? So good. Right? When people come back to you and say, oh my gosh, Renee, I thought I was getting this and that would have been worth it. But then I, this happened and that was transformational. Absolutely. And it freed me up to do this or that, or Mm -hmm. there was a resource now that I'm using, you know, that this person or this thing that came to my business is now doing Mm -hmm. that I never imagined we'd be able to do. I know. That's amazing. I know. When my client, we had one particular client come back and say, 
the people that you have found us are going to help us drive the company even further and take us to new heights. And I, I'm like, that's why I get up every day. This is working. You what know? an amazing experience for yeah. you, right? Wait, that's so, inc- you know, yeah. as a business owner and entrepreneur, that is so incredibly valuable. What that, because that's something that's legacy that builds mm-hmm. when you do that you're not only taking care of that company but that that person that you oh, match with that company yes. that changes their life Absolutely. it changes their family's life it changes their community's life their churches or their synagogues or maybe they don't have any of those affiliations maybe it's just their you know what whatever groups that they're a part of they're now giving into and giving more life to mm-hmm. that's a that's a really cool deal mm-hmm. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> That's really great. Cheers. Cheers to that. So with our whiskey, what we've done is, you know, what we're trying to do is, I, I think whiskey is so, I mean, do you know that whiskey means water of life? Did you know that? I did not. It's another little fact. Little fact I'm a life them. learner, though. I've learned multiple things today <laughs> from you, Phil. <laughs> That's where it comes from. The wh- whiskey means water of life. Whiskey was actually, so Brother Justice was a monk, but the connection between monks and whiskey didn't just happen 100 years ago. It actually happened 1,000 years ago. Irish monks invented whiskey. So they were the first ones about in the, eight, in the 800s and the 900s. That's where my brain starts to explode <laughs> at that point. <laughs> Because we're being like a manuscript scholar, working in manuscripts and going to early, early sources, like it helps, right? You discover some stuff as you're kind of rooting around and things. Um, but yeah, Irish monks invented whiskey about somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 years ago. They discovered the, dis- you know, the secrets of distillation, which is just really, uh, the way I describe it to my, I, I, sh- I tend to say the way I describe it to like my nine and seven year old, my 10 and seven year old. I really mean this is how I think about it. And then I just tell them when, even if they're not interested. Um, (laughs) But whiskey is like if she at my daughter asked me, well, you know, what's the distillery, dad? I say, well, the distillery is where we make a beer. We turn the beer into a cloud. We make the cloud rain. And then the drops we collect are whiskey. I love it. That's how you would describe it to a kindergartner. That's one of my questions. That's that's how you do it. That's what it is. Whiskey is is beer cloud rain. Love it. Aged in oak. Beer cloud rain, beer aged cloud in rain. oak. Can never forget it. Can't forget it. Mm-mm. So it's all about the rain, right? It's all about the beer. Make it. Phil's be making it into rain. The cloud. <laughs> Not yet. Investors, I will. <laughs> um, but the, yeah, so that's where, we're, when we're doing that, that's all, so it's all about the beer. It's all about, I, I mentioned earlier, that a whiskey should be like a dish. It should be like a meal. It's got to be a balance of flavors and textures, the right seasoning, the right, you know, the right sort of like main flavors, the right complementary flavors. So if whiskey, and this is where not being a chemist actually is helpful and not being an expert at anything, just sort of being, you know, somebody that just is passionate about things. I like to say that the only thing I'm really good at is being enthusiastic. Oh, like that's, that's really, to that. I, I'm the same way, <laughs> right? If you're enthusiastic, you can go learn about things and you can get other people to join you in something so that their skills and abilities and talents fill in the gaps for the lack of mine. Mm -hmm. Um, But so when we're doing that, just like somebody, if I'm trying to make this dish, but this we're talking about now a meal, we're talking about a dish at a restaurant and I'm a chef, I'm a great chef. I like, I've got this, I've got this idea for a meal. I think it's gonna be incredible. You have to have the ingredients in the pantry. Absolutely. If it's not, if the ingredients aren't in the pantry, you can't make the dish. And so for us, then you gotta I have go this, to the damn grocery store. Then you go to the grocery store. Boo. So the idea for us is there's a balance of like vanilla, caramel, butterscotch, right? So there's these sort of like candy-like sweetnesses that you want, but not too sweet because if it's too sweet, then it's just like, you know, it's just Kahlua or it's just you know Irish cream, right? Which is they have their places too, but they I do. can't do a lot of it. Sure. So I want that sweetness, but then I also want some like grilled fruit. I want some like richer, like put a, put a halved peach on the grill and get that sugar caramelized. Oh, you know what I mean? And then I want some like roasted almonds and roasted hazelnuts. And I want some, um, and then I also want a little bit of campfire smoke. Cause if it's going to be a whiskey, a Minnesota whiskey, it's got to be like the North woods. 
there's got to be a campfire out there because that's how we celebrate our weekends, whether it's the summer or the winter. So those are all flavors that have components. They all have ingredients to make those flavors. Mm -hmm. And you can make those ingredients by brewing beer, especially if you use barley. So single malt means only barley. No corn, no rye, no wheat, no oats, barley. Barley can do anything if you have the skill and the patience and the knowledge to make it happen. And and most beer drinkers understand this sort of intuitively, right? You've got a Pilsner. Mm -hmm. You can imagine a Pilsner. It's super clear. You can see through it, light, crisp, and you've got a porter. Mm -hmm. Dark, thick, chocolatey. That's barley and water. Barley can do anything between that two spectrums. Sure. So when we go into making our whiskey and make our beer, because it's beer turned into a cloud, you make the cloud rain, we need to make sure that that beer has all the ingredients that we want to collect when it rains. Absolutely. So that's the sort of distinguishing feature of our approach to whiskey. And I'm not sure that everybody approaches it exactly that way. I've never heard of any other distillery talking about their whiskey making process that way. Um, This is just something that, you know, just intuitively kind of occurred to me in our in our partners so i love it that was the straight whiskey you asked about the silver Mm -hmm. so silver whiskey now is the beer rain just like regular rain when you distill whiskey it starts off clear huh this is whiskey doesn't look like what whiskey you know what people are used to no but this is it. And it's and when you go to that metaphor of you turn beer into a cloud, make the cloud rain, then it makes sense. It's like, oh, it should be clear because rain is clear. And that's all we're doing. We're distilling out the alcohol, the water, and then a couple of other really, really special ingredients in very small quantities. They have chemical names. I just learned them when I was trying to start the whiskey. There's esters, euganols, all sorts of different things. Mm-hmm. But they're the same. What I think is so fascinating is if we get a banana flavor in our whiskey, for example, and they're there and there's a little bit of banana flavor, there's a little bit of cherry flavor, there's a little bit of almond flavor, very small. It's not because we're adding extracts. It's because the barley, you can brew a barley to create the exact same compound, the exact same, like indistinguishable from what a banana actually produces. Sure. The flavor of banana is the same as the banana flavor in a whiskey, chemically, at this at the root level. You're just getting it from barley instead of getting it from the banana plant. Fascinating. Yeah, that's about unlock, right? It goes, goes back to unlocking the secrets of the universe, right? Like wanting <laughs> to understand what is this world I live in and how does it really work? So I find that really, really wonderful. And so when we make this whiskey, we... We started off just wanting to make the, the, the aged whiskey because that's the hardest thing. You have to add the oak into it. Mm-hmm. So I wouldn't, you know, a lot of distilleries out there will make a clear spirit because it's cheaper. Oh, it you is. can make it today and sell it tomorrow. Because you don't have to store it. Right. Yeah. Right. I can't make it today and sell that tomorrow. I got to make this today and then sell it in the future. So how do I pay the bills between the time that I made it and the time that I sell Absolutely. it? Absolutely. So that's why a lot of clear spirits come out there. So... I didn't want to, I just know myself and I know a little, because I know myself, I know a little bit about human nature. We always try to find the easy way out, right? If we were to start a clear whiskey, well, or a clear spirit, then that's where our business would go because the money's there, right? It comes in, but then it takes our eye off of the ball of what we're really trying to Mm -hmm. create. So we, I made sure that we always were only focused on making the aged whiskeys. And then after we had an aged whiskey that met our standards, then I was like, so I wonder what it tastes like before it goes in the barrel. And that's where the silver whiskey came from. Awesome. It's like, it turns out if you are really there, take are, a lot of time into, you know, making this product, right. the aged product, you're going to have a really good unaged product. Absolutely. So are there other silver whiskeys on the market today? Not like, the, not that we've made. So this is the only unaged single malt whiskey in North America. Wow. There's the federal government, when we put our when we put our label application in to get approval for our label, they were like, what is this? We had to explain it to them because they'd never seen it before. Uh, so that's how we know it's the first. So you said just approve it and just we'll, approve talk it. we'll talk later. We'll talk later. So I'm going to give you a little taste of this. Okay, yeah. This is not for every palate, although there are uh, some of our people like 
you know. Um, Whoa, it smells. It's very strong. different, right? Very so, different. Because the oak has not mellowed this out. This is the new make spirit. This is the whiskey rain. This is the beer rain. So it's going to be almost more like a tequila or even a sake by itself. Oh, that's. Except it's 43% alcohol. Well, it's not bad. I probably wouldn't drink it straight. Yeah, most don't. That's not what it's really there for. But it's not. It's still very smooth. It's very smooth. There's no harsh edge. No. Like, and if you have a vodka, there's always that like little metallic kind of taste of alcohol in it. That's not there. No, it's very smooth. It's the taste is interesting though. I'd rather drink the American mm-hmm. Single yep. malt or yep, but. Yeah, it's very smooth still. It's fascinating. So it, this cocktail makers and mixologists, so we're at Volstead's. Oh, yeah, I've been there. I love it. Isn't it? It's an incredible so place. Fun. We're at, we're at um, that sells this, the other place, Cove and Edina, like some higher end, yeah. you know, W.A. Frost in St. Paul. The higher end whiskey bars and kind of established cocktail places, they love the silver whiskey. Because their bar, their their bartenders can do things with this product that they can't do with any other clear spirit. So at because Volstead's, because of the for, smoothness, because of the smoothness and the complexity and the structure. So we did all this complexity and structure so that when that intense flavor from the yeah. Minnesota grown barrels comes in, they have some place to go. You can kind of tell, right? Now they've had the mm-hmm. silver. You can see, oh yeah. If there's a really intense oak flavor and really intense vanilla flavor and caramel flavors come in, it gets distributed mm-hmm. out by this full body clear whiskey. Mm-hmm. So we're like, I think we're the we're the only clear spirit. Oh no, there's a High West Distillery out of um, Park City, Utah. They have a silver whiskey. They have a clear whiskey on the shelf at Volstead's, but ours is the only other clear whiskey on their 400 whiskey shelf cheers to that cheers to that thanks congrats oh now we got to make a cocktail with it so you can see what you can do with this because that's why they love it it has a unique flavor on its own but it's what you can do with it because it's a really neutral product right you can go in a sweet direction you can go in a citrus direction you can go in a savory direction totally one of my favorite cocktails that i make with the silver is the bloody justice Oh. Right? Instead of a vodka and a Bloody Mary. Yeah. This, because that, because you can't taste the alcohol. You get that warmth and you get that sort of like umami kind of, you know, you get that savoriness underneath it, but you don't get that, you know, most of the Bloody Marys I've had, there's like an aluminum pole standing yes, in the middle. There you just is. taste the alcohol. That's why I'm not a Bloody Mary fan. Exactly. Me neither. <laughs> People are you, like, all the blo- I'm like, no, no, no it's thank just you. Like, it's just like, in a, it's just like in a metal <laughs> pole in a glass of tomato juice. I don't get that. But this, you, it blends in completely where you can't taste the alcohol at all. You just get the, you just get the whiskey flavor and the whiskey warmth. And so that's really cool. Um, but now we're going to make something that the whiskey can do. It can take any flavor that you want um, as you're sort of, building cocktails, which is why a lot of the cocktail centric bars really love this product. So we're going to make something, I call it Canticle of the Sun, which is a poem. Jody's going to be so jealous. (laughs) It's a prayer (laughs) and a poem by St. Francis of Assisi. I call it Canticle of the Sun because we're using the silver whiskey, lemon juice, and pineapple juice. Mm -hmm. So it's just that warm, beautiful, refreshing kind of thing. So I've just got some silver whiskey can of dole 100 pineapple juice Again, perfect don't be too fussy just add a little bit of that in there i'm kind of going roughly proportions i want the whiskey to be roughly half of everything else that i add okay if that makes sense mm-hmm. so then i'm going to add a little nelly and joe's key west lemon juice Ooh. so the pineapple juice more of that i'm going to probably do of the of the remaining half Right, so if half of the cocktail is the silver whiskey, and then I've got another half to play with, about two thirds of the half is going to be pineapple juice. Sure, because it's not super. It gives a flavor, but it's not super strong flavored. Lemon juice, on the other hand, if you overpower on that, oh. that's going to change the drink. So I'm going to do. You got to add more alcohol. You got to goes alcohol. downhill in a hurry. <laughs> so then I add a little bit of the lemon juice, 
And now I'm going to taste it because I just want to see where we are on the sweetness side. Oh, you still, <laughs> still have some. Uh, so now I'm just going to taste this. I've got the pineapple. I've got the lemon. This base of the silver whiskey is there, but you can't taste it because it's sort of filling in the gaps. It's a little tart, which is how it should be. So I'm just going to add that simple syrup that I had because I was making the old fashioned. I'm just going to put a little drop of that in because that simple syrup is just going to sweeten it up a little bit, round everything out. And then we're going to be dreaming of the sun shining yeah. down on us with the ocean in sight mm. and the beautiful sand at our feet. That's where we're going to be. <laughs> and, it's, and it's a much shorter flight. <laughs> and then that Angostura bitters that we used in the old fashioned and that we used mm -hmm. in the um, Manhattan, just to give it that little bit of depth and that little bit of So would extra we call warmth. this kind of a silver old fashioned with pineapple twist? You could, you could. And lemon, except you're also adding oh, lemon. Oh yeah, this the is, lemon. This is typically more, this is more complicated than I normally do, but it's the two sides, right? So I've got, I've got the whiskey, silver whiskey. I'm still building that around, and then I'm adding maybe a potato, or I'm adding a potato, and I'm adding a leafy veg. Sure. Right. So that's my that's my drink, and then I just seasoned it with. I didn't add oh, ice. I can't wait. Do you want ice? Do we need ice? I don't think we need it right <laughs> How now. How many cocktails can I drink in <laughs> one shot? <laughs> mm. I could, the aroma, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's incredible. Like, you can't even taste that. This is danger. This is danger, danger. Danger, Will Robbins. Danger, Will Robbins. There is, danger. you could drink this. There, no, no, no. Like, whoa, way too easy to drink. You have to be really responsible. Oh my. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. What do you call this? I call it Canticle of the Sun. Canticle of the Sun. Oh yeah. my goodness. You can't, like, I could, I'd have to limit myself because that's way too easy to drink. Mm -hmm. And that's half, that's half whiskey. That is so delicious. <laughs> Thank you. Jody. Really I'm, it. I'm so grateful you introduced me to Phil because <laughs> I got to have the cocktail we were supposed to make for you on your episode. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Parties can either start with this or they can end with this. <laughs> you, I don't know know, if, you know what I mean? I don't know. That's a difficult decision to make. Yeah. Yeah, I you think start with it, uh, You everyone might be sleeping over. That's what I'm saying. Like, you might have the shortest cocktail party of all time. Because if you start with this, people will say, oh, I'll just have another one of these. Can I just go on more of these? And so well, and you can't compare it to a margarita, but its drinkability is mm -hmm. just like the margarita mm -hmm. you were talking about. Oh, my goodness. You could. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. And it's simple, right? Half Super this. simple. Of the remaining half, about, whoops, of the remaining half, about two-thirds pineapple juice canned, right? It's nothing fussy. A little bit of lemon juice, and then add your bitters. Just a couple of dashes, two, three dashes, because if without the bitters, it would be too sweet, right? And then taste it, and then just add a little simple syrup as needed to kind of just round out the edges. And there it is. How did you come up with this? So we are actually very fortunate. Uh, one of my friends is a woman named Emily Yang. Emily Yang uh, has, she's, she's moving on from, I think, bartending. She's getting her, uh, I think she's getting her master's degree in counseling right now, but she has been the bartender at the downtown Pizza Luce in Minneapolis. Oh, fun. And she's an Iron, City Pages Iron Fork winner. Super talented person. And Emily came up with this cocktail for us. She oh. deserves all the credit for it. She That's fantastic. That yeah. I yeah. love it. So what advice, what, what's the greatest advice you've ever received? Oh my gosh. Um, I think I've got so many, there's so many. Okay. Right? We just so need one. one. Yeah. There's so many people one. that, um, what's like just one, what comes to mind right now, Phil, in the moment, cruise and cocktails, 
Making it. I think I needed to get this one to ask like six top cocktails ago. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let me, let me get a, I gotta, I gotta sift through all the mentors that I've worked with. Um, You know, this is so. This is right now. You know, my head is in the space where I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a startup person, so my head is around that. There's so much advice that's applicable that I've received over the years, um, and and so I'm just thinking in terms of a business person. This is going to sound really weird, but if you're a business person, weird. some of the best advice I received was pay your lawyers and insurance early. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I'm laughing because when I started Talent Q, I had a partner and I had chose the attorney. She had chose everything else, the accountant and all of that. And in the end, it was a complete blessing. But we had all the legal documents in place if somebody was going to exit. So yes. cheers to that advice. Isn't it right? Yeah. You just always, because you can't see the future. You cannot. It's all about risk management. You, everything in life is a risk. To not act is a risk. To Absolutely. not try is a risk. Well, that's the law of cause and effect, yeah. right? Yeah. So, Phil, what would you tell your 20-something-year-old self if you could? Chill out. <laughs> I love it. Just relax. You know, don't don't try so hard. Enjoy it. I um, love it's that. It's going to come together. I love that. So where can everyone find you and your phenomenal whiskey? The only whiskey that I drink now. No, that's really nice. Thank you. I'm totally honest, by the way. Appreciate Renee Fry never tells a lie. Uh, you can't. Mm -mm. Keep your promises. Tell the truth. Absolutely. I appreciate that very much. So you can find us. Uh, we're in an increasing number of liquor stores and bars. Uh, it's a dynamic thing. So the best way to find us is go to brotherjustice.com. J-U-S-T-U-S. -U -U brotherjustice.com. And just scroll down to the front of our homepage. There's a whole thing called Find Us. And it has a updated, interactive map and list of liquor stores, bars, restaurants, specialty shops where you can find Brother Justice. Awesome. And I am so grateful that you, that Jody introduced us yeah, and you too. were able to come on. Thank and you very thank much. Thank you so much for sharing all these wonderful, simple cocktails with us. Thank you. That our listeners will certainly enjoy. Well, I really Cheers. appreciate it. Thank you. If you have enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and click the bell. For all of you hiring leaders who want to know the secrets to finding the best talent, go to careersandcocktails.com to download your hiring guide. And for all of you job seekers who are ready to love your Mondays, you can go to careersandcocktails.com to find out where to purchase my book, I Hate Mondays. Cheers. Cheers.